Welcome to the February Market Outlook. Uh, we've entitled this one Democratizing Finance, uh, a theme we should be constantly revisiting in our space. And uh, we're very excited uh, for the presentation we have today and a very special guest uh, who's joining us. So stay tuned. We'll get started here in just another 10, 15 seconds. Welcome again to the February Market Outlook from blockchain.com. All right, so we'll be streaming this live and it'll also be available again on our YouTube channel and uh, we'll be sharing it uh, across all of our socials as well as on Twitter. So uh, if you miss anything today, you'll be able to revisit any parts of the conversation. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, welcome to the February Market Outlook from blockchain.com entitled Democratizing Finance. Uh, my name is Nicholas Carey. I'm the co-founder of blockchain.com, the founding commissioner for the Commission for Sustainable Development and the author of The Future is Decentralized. And I'm really excited uh, today we'll be joined um, by uh, Amin Goons here, who's an amazing uh, crypto contributor um, and the founder of Avalabs and more. So stay tuned for that. Um, we will be going through a whole bunch of questions with him. But first, I um, want to give you a quick update on what we've been working on over here at blockchain.com. So for those of you that don't know, uh, we're on a mission here to build a financial system for the internet that empowers anyone to control their money. And talk to you a little bit about what we've been doing. So um, there are really sort of a couple of things you should be aware of. Um, over 80 million people have signed up for a blockchain.com wallet over the past decade, where a 10-year-old company and over a trillion dollars have been uh, transacted via our wallets on chain. We continue to be the first place that many people begin their cryptocurrency journeys. And uh, you can visit blockchain.com to learn a lot more about what's happening in the market. Visit the blog. And we also have a really exciting block, Explore, that lets you uh, see what's happening on chain with all the different uh, communities that we support. So the team has been super busy. Um, there's sort of two sides to blockchain.com. There's the retail side or the consumer side. So you can download a wallet from iOS, Android, um, or log in online. And uh, that's a great way to get started. You really need a wallet to be able to send, receive, secure, trade, and exchange different forms of digital wealth. Uh, we have the blockchain.com exchange, uh, one of the top 10 exchanges in the world. If you're a little bit more of a sophisticated user, that's a great place to also do some trading. The blockchain.com explorer continues to be one of the most widely used uh, uh, sites for research and looking on chain what's happening. We have a variety of partnerships um, we also announce on a regular basis. On the other side of the blockchain.com experience is really our institutional offering. We have an entire lending operation, um, which we'd love to talk to partners about. We do over the counter and spot trading, liquidity and execution. Um, we participate in a bunch of these uh, DeFi protocols and we even offer custody and asset management solutions uh, for firms looking for exposure in that way. So the team has been busy. Um, the last 30 days, we've shipped a bunch of stuff. So if you haven't already um, updated your wallets and your apps, make sure you do that. It's important to always have your uh, latest and greatest um, downloaded from the app stores. We just announced a partnership uh, with Cloud9, which is uh, one of the first esports teams. They were really uh, sort of famous for their work in the Halo universe, uh, which is near and dear to my heart, one of the games I grew up playing. Um, so really excited about that partnership with Cloud9. Uh, Stripe debit card payments are now live across the US. Uh, crypto trading in Washington state has been enabled for everyone that lives there. Uh, Marcy Vu has joined the blockchain.com board of directors as well as Tim Horton, um, who is uh, one of the lead uh, independent directors of both Walmart and uh, General Electric. So we're really grateful to have Tom joining uh, myself and the rest of the directors um, on the governance level. And then if you didn't know, uh, there's a really interesting new project called the BFF DAO which uh, was launched by the chief administration officer of blockchain.com, as well as a bunch of celebrities um, around the world. And it's really a community for women creating content um, about crypto and uh, really uh, have seen incredible traction from that group. So if you want sort of a different forum and a kind of a different content style, definitely uh, check out the BFF DAO. Okay, um, quick update. We've uh, launched um, a, a margin product for eligible uh, jurisdictions on the blockchain.com exchange. So you can log in to see uh, if you are one of the lucky um, users in a place that you can try that feature out. Uh, we are offering uh, 30 days of uh, margin with 0% interest. So a great way to test that feature out, um, but make sure you understand what you're doing there. That is definitely designed for more professional traders. Next slide. Um, the rewards rates uh, for the following month. So if you're holding any of these uh, digital assets right now, you can earn some extra income while your crypto works while you sleep and you can deposit that uh, right within your wallet in eligible jurisdictions. Uh, so we'd love to see um, some deposits if you're interested in earning some rewards. And then uh, made a bunch of changes to the blockchain.com exchange interface. So if you're using that, please continue to send us some feedback. Uh, we build tools to help you. So let us know what we can do a better job with. 
And then uh, last but not least, uh, just a little plug here. <laughs> we have uh, just passed the 500 uh, person mark in the company and we have well over 80 positions still available. Um, so uh, regardless of where you are in your career, or where you are in the world, we hire on a global basis. Um, we have a ton of open positions, adding muscle across the entire company. Uh, so please uh, share those in your social networks, apply for a role here. Um, we'd love to have a conversation. Okay, so uh, last month uh, we did our uh, monthly market outlook and we had a special guest, Jeremy Allaire, the co-founder, chairman, and CEO of Circle, talk to us a little bit more um, about central bank digital currencies, about stable coins, and Circle's vision uh, to make it easier for all people to have digital dollars. Really interesting conversation and definitely encourage everyone to go revisit that discussion. So today um, we'll be doing something not too dissimilar, uh, but with our own, a new special guest, um, we have the market outlook and on-chain um, coverage um, from Dr. Garrick Heilman and our special guest, uh, Emin Gutierrez, who I'll be introducing uh, in just a little bit. So uh, without further ado, I'll be handing this over now uh, to Dr. Garrick Heilman. Um, he's the head of research here at blockchain.com and one of the most cited cryptocurrency and blockchain technology researchers. Uh, he's taught um, and created the first uh, class on blockchain technology at the University of Cambridge and has authored leading research on cryptocurrencies, market stable coins, and broader trends um, on macroeconomic conditions. He was ranked as one of the most influential economists. Uh, so uh, we're lucky to have him and he regularly shares his perspectives on the FT, BBC, CNBC, and many more. And so uh, looking forward uh, to hearing what you can share with us today. Thank you, Dr. Garrick Heilman. Hey, thank you, Nick. And uh, I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, most cited rather than, uh, or one of the most cited. I think I think Emin, who we're gonna be speaking to here in a little bit has uh, quite a few more citations, academic citations than I do. Um, so very excited for that conversation uh, here shortly. Let's quickly just talk about the markets. Uh, you know, I think uh, people are aware that crypto and markets in general had a rough January. Uh, I think the macro story around um, the Fed tightening um, is, is really driving a lot of the, the downward action. Bitcoin down close to 17%, Ethereum down 27%. Uh, the dollar you know, is the one thing that was green up, up 1% on the month. Uh, so markets across the board uh, took a bit of a hit. The one thing that caught our attention, uh, you know, we do see a lot of correlation between uh, crypto and, and, and equities and tech equities, uh, but there are some glimmers that, uh, you know, crypto sometimes can march to the beat of its own drummer. Um, and that's something we're really trying to keep an eye out for. As, as market participants become more uh, focused on crypto as an asset class uh, with its own set of fundamentals, uh, we would like to see and we expect to see uh, some decoupling uh, with, with equity markets and it not just trading as a kind of a higher beta version of a tech stock. Um, but, but, you know, we're seeing some evidence of that, but still uh, crypto often does move in line with other markets. And that's also to be expected to some degree as it becomes a more established and integrated asset class uh, into the portfolios of, of retail and institutional professional traders. On chain, uh, we, we saw a decline in, in Bitcoin network activity across the board, except for hash rate, the amount of computing power that is mining Bitcoin continue to increase. Uh, you know, we're still seeing... Um, growth in, in markets like North America, the amount of uh, mining power, even with um, you know, the price decline, significant to price decline in, in January. And I think that speaks to the, the optimism uh, and outlook uh, across uh, the mining space uh, on, on Bitcoin's market potential. You know, we're seeing some evidence of more politicians in the US uh, getting interested in adding Bitcoin as legal tender uh, or something you could pay your taxes with uh, in, in, in states like Arizona, Texas, Wyoming. You know, we've called this kind of the crypto uh, final adoption frontier, the day where one day you could pay your taxes with something like Bitcoin. Uh, it's really incredible, just 13 years into the, the journey of Bitcoin since it was launched, that we're already starting to see nation states, um, jurisdictions in the U.S. starting to contemplate this. Uh, and it's a, it's a pretty big deal. Uh, that, that's something they cer certainly something to keep an eye on. Um, you know, there'll probably be some legal challenges around that, uh, but it certainly speaks to the growing broad-based support uh, and just uh, way in which crypto is being woven into, into our everyday lives and, and how it really aligns also with, with um, you know, democratic institutions. Partly why we picked this theme this month is, is you're seeing democracies you know, the U.S. is, is uh, you know, uh, certainly seeing a lot of increased crypto activity and, and people are kind of responding to the, the way crypto assets and blockchain networks open up access to the financial system 
and are aligned with the values of democracies, transparency, openness, accessibility, um, you know, all these kind of core principles that underpin blockchain networks uh, are certainly aligned with, we think, democratic institutions. So uh, that's something to keep, keep an eye on. All right, without any further ado, I'm gonna hand it back over to Nick to introduce our very special guest this month. All right, thank you so much, Garrick. Um, so we're already seeing a bit of a correction heading into early February. So maybe at the end of this month, um, we'll, uh, we'll see a little more stability in the market. January was definitely a tr uh, tougher one. So without further ado, our featured guest today is Amin Gunsir, uh, the founder of Avalabs and co-director of the Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Smart Contracts, IC3. Uh, among a very long resume, uh, Sir is known for having implemented the first currency that used proof of work to mint coins for selfish mining, for uh, characterizing the scale and centralization of existing cryptocurrencies, as well as having proposed the leading protocols for on-chain and off-chain scaling. Of all of his collaborations though, he's proudest of his contribution to John Oliver's show, uh, the segment on cryptocurrencies. And if you haven't seen that one, highly recommend uh, checking that one out on YouTube. Um, uh, John Oliver does always a good job summarizing things in a ways a lot of people uh, can digest. So I'm really excited uh, to revisit a conversation and a friendship today with Amin Gunsir. Um, welcome to the blockchain.com podcast. Uh, thank you very much for having me, Nick. All right, so we have a little tradition around here. Um, we uh, First question we always ask is, how did you earn your first buck, pound, lira, dollar? Uh, what was the way you earned your first little bit of currency? My first lira was uh, when I was in middle school um, and I had a Commodore 64. And that was when PCs were just making their inroads into small businesses. And IBM was selling this, uh, this accounting software, this accounting suite. It cost $150. And uh, it did accounts receivable, accounts payable, it did all inventory, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I looked at it and uh, I copied everything they did feature by feature, wrote it from scratch in basic on Commodore 64 and I sold it for 60 bucks. And uh, I remember my first sale, it was amazing. I bought dessert. I grew up in a very big house with a lot of people. And uh, I bought some Turkish dessert, brought, brought, brought it home, felt like a big man. I was in middle school. And, uh, and, and then the last, last little bit about that first buck was um, about half my sales were followed on by a special sale. So people would buy the suite. They would start to use it. And then they would call me up and they'd be like, you know, this is great and all, but I need another feature. And then, you know, after the first call, I'd be like, okay, well, what is it? You know, I knew, I knew what it was. Um, the feature they all wanted was double accounting. They wanted one set of official books and another set of real books. <laughs> so that was the reality of, uh, of life in Turkey back then. And oh. uh, it was great. I, so I, I ended up selling the same thing twice. Like I, you know, I had this module that plugged in and kept track of the real books as well. It was great. <laughs> I love that story. Thank you very much uh, for sharing that. So um, in your early life, you were already super into computers. Um, how did you become interested in computer science and, and how did you end up choosing academia um, as sort of your path? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, you never really know these things, right? I mean, uh, some people search, some people are very deliberate. In my case, it was almost predestined. I grew up, um, as I alluded to, in, in Turkey back in, uh, you know, back in the day. And uh, just to give you an idea of how things worked back then, you know, we, we, we grew up in these, in these apartments, you know, in these big, big whatever, uh, uh, flats, and um, things didn't just work back then, you know, like the, even like basic stuff, like the doors would close, but not close entirely. Windows would close, but not really perfectly. They were drafty houses. You'd go to the bank and they'd be like, come back tomorrow, we're having a problem with our systems. Uh, there were electricity outages. And so, so that's the environment that kind of shaped me. And all I wanted was, was stuff that worked. I wanted to build things that gave you a strong guarantee and stood behind it. So, and I love the simplicity of the computer world. I loved how you could control everything about it. And I wanted to learn how I could build things that were resilient, that were here to stay, uh, that scaled and worked and so on. So that's essentially my start. And, uh, and then academia just sucks you in. I, I was... I ended up getting a scholarship to go to Princeton. And uh, at the end of Princeton, I was like, I want to study more. Like there's so much more to learn, but 
I can't afford like a master's program. It's just, it's going to be expensive. So, um, so I was like, well, why don't I get into a PhD program? These uh, American universities, they give you a master's on the way to your PhD. I'll get a master's and I'll get out. That was the trick. And of course, once you get, get in there, it sucks you in. The problems are so appealing. The projects are so exciting. So I was like, okay, hey, I'll do this for a while. And it's, it's been a great ride. Kindred spirits here with, uh, with Garrick, I think. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, uh, your paper, uh, Evan, on selfish mining was one of the, I think, really kind of first blockbuster papers uh, on cryptocurrency. And I think it's just interesting for our audience to hear a bit more about kind of your journey into looking at crypto from an academic perspective, that particular paper, um, and, and how it's held up uh, over time. Yeah, that's been a fun paper. Um, so uh, for those of you who in the audience who don't know, uh, what we did back, I don't know how many years ago now, probably eight, nine years ago, was uh, start looking into Bitcoin mining. And uh, there were a bunch of things that people repeated, like the, what we call folk theorems. People believe these things. There wasn't any proof. And uh, these theorems essentially say something like Bitcoin is perfect the way it is. And if you deviate from the protocol, you lose money. It's in your best interest to do what Satoshi told you to do. And, uh, and that's the property that you really deeply want, because if... If, if people will make more money by following something different, then, then the creator wasn't all that great after all. And, uh, you know, they, and, and the system might splinter and so on. So we started looking into Bitcoin. We discovered that there were tricks you could do. Um, they all involve what we call block withholding. So you, you join the mining game as a miner. And instead of just following the protocol and telling other people when you find a block, you keep these blocks secret. You keep them behind your back. And uh, that allows you to trick, trick other people. So once you have a block in your hand, in essence, you're ahead of everyone else, right? The, you, you, the, they're working on a stale, stale problem to which you know the solution. So you could use that knowledge to actually trump them to, uh, to, make, to, to make their hard work go to waste. And that's sort of the, the core idea behind selfish mining. And if you use selfish mining um, for some hash power X, you will end up getting rewards greater than X. So that tells you that, that, uh, that deviating from the protocol is actually profitable. Uh, so this has all sorts of ramifications. It was quite a surprise to us. It was me and Itai Eyal. Itai is now a professor in, at the Technion in Israel. And um, quite a surprising result um, made to, to many people as well. And so when we put it out, I got all sorts of vitriol from the internet. Everybody hated me. They complained, they wrote letters to Cornell, um, all sorts of nasty attacks on, online. And uh, they even funded, they crowdfunded three different efforts to prove our work wrong. And uh, <laughs> so uh, it was just bizarre to watch. And every one of those efforts, the, the person in charge of them turned around after a while, they built their own simulator and said, you know what? The simulator actually says exactly what these guys have been saying also. So uh, it's held up. And that's the nice thing about science. It is a little slow at times and you just have to sit and take all the arrows on social media. And, uh, but you, if you wait enough and if you've got the time to wait, then you actually get rewarded because objective reality is inescapable. It is what it is. So yeah, no, overall, um, people went from hating on us to suddenly begrudgingly saying, you know, they're right to, you know, these people actually know a thing or two. And, uh, and, and I think everybody perceives these things as an attack. It's not. And our intention there was, let's understand these protocols better. Let's figure out ways to make them better. So the maximalists will always hate this. For them, Satoshi is God. For them, Bitcoin is perfect, cannot be improved upon. But anybody who's coming into the space for the technology, anybody who's science-oriented, anybody who's a techie can immediately see the value of this stuff. And it's been a great ride after that. So I worked on a whole bunch of things after that. And uh, what started out as sort of a fun side project turned into a lifetime obsession now. Yeah, well, I, I remember um, at the 2016 Scaling Bitcoin Conference in Milan uh, mm -hmm. pr presentation you gave. And there was a warm, I thought a, a pretty warm applause at the end of that. So I think some of the Bitcoiners at least came around to appreciating uh, your work and in, in, uh, highlighting uh, strengths and weaknesses of the protocol. So that was, that was nice to see. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us about um, your, uh, you know, kind of being in academia, researching these networks and, and then kind of crossing over, you know, kind of into developing them. And, and, and we'd love to hear about kind of the, 
you know, Cornell Center and, and just kind of how that whole evolution took place. A few academics have also made this journey, um, but uh, maybe not quite as successfully as, as you have. So tell us your story there. Sure. Um, so back in uh, 13 or so, I started, you know, doing research in this area and um, uh, around 15 or so, 2015 or so, uh, we, we realized that, you know, the area is big, it's going to grow and it deserves a scientific approach and a, and a set of people who bring legitimacy, scientific uh, studies, and, uh, and a whole bunch of other things, you know, advocacy as well. Um, so to make that happen, we started what we called, uh, we can't call it a center. To call something a center, you have to have a lot of uh, money, plus you have to have approval from the university and it's going to take forever, et cetera. So, uh, so instead we called it an initiative so we started this thing called Initiative for Cryptocurrencies and Smart Contracts, IC3. And, uh, and very early on, we decided that this should, be, this should span the world. This should not be a Cornell-only kind of a thing. So it's really eight different schools. There's Cornell, there's Cornell Tech, but there's also Berkeley in it, uh, UIUC, Urbana-Champaign in it, uh, ETH Zurich, EPFL, University College London, uh, in Technion, and um, I'm, I'm sure I'm leaving out another school over there, but uh, there are about eight different schools inside the initiative, about 100 or so PhD students, um, quite a few, I think about 20 uh, professors involved in the effort uh, to make the blockchain space better and to bring it to a scientific foundation. So it's been a great ride. IC3 is thriving. Um, I've stepped away from Cornell. I've, I've left Cornell as of last September, and uh, I'm now full time at Alva Labs working on the Avalanche system. And, and you're you're not on like a, a leave of absence. Uh, no. I mean, yeah, yeah. I was. Some, yep. Some some uh, some academics have have been reluctant to to leave the cozy confines, the the warm underbelly of of safe academia. They'll go on a leave at a crypto project. I'm not going to name any names here, um, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they don't quite want to completely step away. Um, you, you've you've uh, severed that and and really moved into this space full time. And and what really uh, motivated that uh, that and was that a hard decision to kind of let it that was go? Such, it was such an easy decision. Although deep down, every now and then, I still feel like a professor. And uh, the professorial habits never die down. My answers to all your questions are way longer than they ought to be. You know, these are all old habits. But uh, yeah, no, it was quite straightforward for me. Um, I started, you know, with this whole avalanche thing came about and we started building a system around it. And I wanted to make sure that it was carried out successfully. A lot of my other work has been adopted, but when you're not the one doing the adoption, then it gets pulled in funny directions or people get tripped up on small things and they don't, they pick a path that's not really optimal for the technology. And I wanted, uh, Avalanche is such a big step forward that I wanted to make sure that it would succeed. So, uh, so we, I started Ava Labs and uh, that company has grown to 150 plus people now. And um, the uh, effort is incredibly successful, I would say, because it's being adopted. There's organic growth. Just this morning, Paris Hilton was buying stuff on top of Avalanche. She, I don't know if she even realized she was doing it. it was I saw great. that on Twitter. <laughs> Isn't that great? Like that's, it's like people don't even know that you're, they're using your product probably. And it's, it's just there. So, uh, so, so yeah. Let's so this talk a little bit there. about that. Um, so for the audience that uh, is maybe new to learning about this, what is Avalanche? Um, give us an introduction. Sure. Avalanche is the latest generation uh, of uh, blockchain platforms that combines a couple of really exciting breakthroughs. It's a brand new layer one. It's got its own token called Avax, and uh, it is much faster than every other chain out there, and it's much more flexible than every other chain out there. The reasons for this are twofold. It has a revolutionary new consensus protocol that operates differently from everything else you've heard about. So you might have heard about Ethereum 2 to come. You might have heard about proof of stake protocols of other types. Uh, you know, of course, about Bitcoin and Ethereum 1, the current one based on proof of work. Um, Avalanche is different from all of those. And it uses this, uh, this gossip-based mechanism that achieves consensus far faster uh, because not every node that's part of the system has to talk to every other node. In these other systems, they end up having to have all-to-all -all communication. Avalanche avoids it, and that's why its confirmation times are 740 milliseconds, even as I speak. So you submit something, and what takes an hour on Bitcoin takes 740 milliseconds on Avalanche. 
That's kind of like a, a slow blink of an eye or maybe two blinks of an eye. So it's super fast and it's got this revolutionary new architecture uh, where anybody can start what we call a subnet underneath Avalanche. So these subnets allow you to run your own virtual machine and to have your own validators. These are all technical terms, but for the non-techies, what that means is you can have your own blockchain subject to your own rules, and you can have legal structures and legal agreements that go down to the leaves, so you control the assets on blockchain, on your blockchain. So this is essential if you have an, an enterprise with valuable things and you want to put it on a blockchain. You control the full lifetime of your asset. And uh, we're one of only a handful of protocols that give you a structure like this. Every other coin, like Bitcoin, Ethereum, these are monolithic. They have one coin, one chain, one network. Whereas Avalanche allows you to have multiple coins subject to their own rules with their own virtual machines and their own networks. So think of it as a blockchain as a service. Think of it as a blockchain that's customizable. Think of it as a blockchain that allows you to uh, take legal restrictions into account. So you can create subnets that, uh, that allow you to do this. And uh, we're very excited about what we can do with this. There are many uses for subnets and I'm, I'm so thrilled to uh, explore them in, in the years ahead. That, that's, uh, that was fantastic and, and not too long-winded at all from my perspective, <laughs> at least. Uh, so, um, and, and you raise, uh, I think a lot of really important points that kind of help explain why Avalanche has had such a breakout year. We've seen um, a lot of interest in, in new applications, um, you know, like NFTs, non-fungible tokens, blockchain-based gaming, things that are gonna require a lot more speed, throughput, capacity, and, and Avalanche is, you know, I think one of the leading blockchains uh, to, that could accommodate those kinds of use cases. Do you want to talk a bit more about that uh, aspect and, and, and um, you know, kind of this getting away from just digital gold and, and, and other things that blockchains could be used for and should be used for in your view? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there's a big difference in vision between Avalanche and many other systems. And uh, just like you mentioned, I think Bitcoin's goal is to be a replacement for uh, stores of value, for digital to become digital gold, to be a replacement for US dollar, or at least some of the uses for the US dollar. And that's a wonderful goal, and it's not exactly our goal. Ethereum's goal has been to build a computer in the sky, something that's programmable, somewhere where you can send code and it executes on a blockchain. That's something we also do, but it's not our goal. Um, our goal is to create an environment where, you, we can, where people can digitize all of the world's assets. We want to create the kind of platform that has the scale and the flexibility to turn every, every single valuable thing on people's balance sheets, on, in people's possession, into their counterparts on blockchains that can be traded freely across the globe. That's our goal. And that difference in vision really underlies all of the other differences between our system and everyone else's. So um, it's, that's, that's how we engineered it. And that's the goal that we're striving towards. And so to that end, uh, there are many different uses, simultaneous and independent uses of the Avalanche network. We have a contract chain, for example, that supports the Ethereum virtual machine. Everything you can do on Ethereum, you can do on Avalanche, much faster with much less, much less in fees. We also have another subnet for asset transfers. That's kind of like the Bitcoin network where you can create assets to be transferred, sent around, et cetera. And even as we speak, people are creating new subnets for storing data. They're creating new subnets for doing gaming. There are new subnets coming up for enterprise-oriented uses, including disaster recovery and post-disaster accounting. This is a partnership we have with Deloitte, for example. So, so this is where we are. Um, it's, I think we're bringing a, a fresh look into this whole space. It's not just one coin, one chain, but it's many, many, many different uses that are isolated from each other that happen in parallel, uh, where people are in charge of what happens on their own chain. I'm, I'm excited to ask you this next question because I know you can put your academic hat on and and um, and and um, talk about the trade-offs uh, of blockchain design choices. Oftentimes, uh, people think, "Oh, you have to give up something to get something," uh, and and um, if you want decentralization, you may compromise on speed or or uh, scalability or something of that nature. And um, 
I imagine a lot of people, um, knowing that you've spent years researching blockchain technologies, uh, maybe think you found the holy grail, the perfect set of trade-offs. Um, can you talk about the design choices? And if you could even be a bit critical, like where would you say, oh, we've maybe you know, gone more in this direction and traded off this thing that some people think is really important, but we, for our vision, don't agree and haven't, haven't prioritized it to this, the same way as other blockchains? Yeah, that's a great question. There are always trade-offs, that is true. Um, but I do want to caution the listeners against uh, always accepting a compromise. So um, I want to give you a simple example. So there is this, uh, this, uh, this, this blockchain trilemma. This is also a folk theorem. And it says that you know, of, the, of, um, uh, you know, of speed, scalability, and security, you always have to have a compromise. And uh, so I'm not going to come up here and say we solved it, but I want to give you an analogy. Imagine that we were living 150 years past and all we had were shovels. Okay, and what do you care about in a shovel? Well, I can name three things about a shovel that I really care about, right? Um, you know, amount of effort it use, used to, to use it, ease of use, amount of uh, dirt you can move with it, and, uh, and cost, okay? So, uh, so that's sort of like three things I care about. And, uh, and I can create all these trilemmas. They all sound good. They're gonna be so catchy. And the social media is gonna eat this stuff up. Um, but there is really no fundamental basis for that particular trilemma. And when someone shows up with a, um, with a steam shovel, you then suddenly realize, hey, these three things that I cared about in the context of a shovel no longer apply. Yes, there are trade-offs, but they're in a different dimension. So when it comes to speed, scale, and security, Avalanche is by far superior to everything that exists. It is more decentralized than all of these other coins that you see out there. If you look at proof of stake protocols that people want to use, they are typically talking about having about 100, maybe 150 participants in every round of decision. So at the network level, when a decision is being taken, it's a very small number of nodes involved in that decision. They will have big sets, but they do subsampling out of that set. You might think you're participating, but you're getting cut out by some process that's invisible to you. When people are thinking about proof of work protocols, they're looking at people you know, participating in, in those protocols requires enormous amounts of energy and is damaging to the environment. Avalanche is different. There's no mining and um, anyone can participate. All the nodes participate in every round of decisions. And we have thousands of nodes participating in our main net today. We've had many more for our test nets. So this is the universe that we're living in that, that we haven't made the most fundamental trade-off that everybody else makes, which is a trade-off of decentralization. We achieved speed by changing the way the nodes communicate and what they say to each other. We achieved scalability by again using a better protocol. And we did all this without compromising decentralization. Now to be critical, what's the, what, what's the hidden dimension on which we gave up something? Well, that is complexity. This is a different kind of protocol. Proof of work, you know, I can, I can have master students write you. I used to do this. Uh, in five days, they can write you a proof of work protocol. It's by now, it's not, it's, it was revolutionary when Bitcoin came out, but by now it's well understood. Its problems are well characterized. And so, so we know how that works. Proof of stake protocols are far more complicated to write, the classical ones. And, uh, but you know, they're also well understood. Avalanche, it's new. And, uh, and it's going to, it might very well take effort uh, to get Avalanche to be, uh, to, be, uh, to be as performant or as well parameterized as others. And there might well be complexities that we don't foresee right now that become apparent as we deploy the protocol. So uh, it's new tech. That's, I think, the biggest, biggest, um, biggest issue with Avalanche. Uh, there are unknowns associated with it. It's not as well understood. And, uh, and, so, uh, and, and tuning it so that it's as well engineered as these other systems is going to take time. And we, in fact, there have been some, some scenarios where, for example, our fees were spiking a few months ago because our parameters were not set properly. So that's the kind of risk we face, and we faced a lot of backlash. And uh, after a little bit of uh, study, I think within within five days we had a response, and within ten days it was deployed. Uh, but you know we have to be engaged in that kind of effort. This is not a fire and forget kind of system. We still have a lot of engineering ahead of us to make sure that all of the tuning is done. 
So that's, uh, that's I think, if I could, if I were to point to like, what actually takes my time, that's what takes my time. That's the hidden unknown and not very well characterized. Yet. Yeah, well, it's, it's interesting you mentioned complexity because I remember in the early days, um, you know, when Ethereum was, you know, just kind of uh, getting started, a lot of Bitcoiners looked at Ethereum and said, it's too complicated, it's never gonna ship. Uh, and, and that was kind of one of the main concerns or criticisms around Ethereum from the Bitcoin crowd. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, you know, a lot of code was, was uh, written and, and it shipped and, and, and certainly has had a lot of success. So I think we've already seen examples of other, you know, seemingly complex blockchain networks uh, with enough persistence uh, succeed and, and launch and do well. And, you know, Avalanche is another great example of that. Um, this term uh, Ethereum killer, uh, you know, gets thrown around a lot. I, I'm just curious what you make of it. Um, you know, you're active on, on social media. Um, you know, how do you think about this competition with Ethereum? Uh, you know, you mentioned already being able to run uh, on a subnet, you know, uh, you know, Ethereum things and, and do those faster and cheaper than you can on Ethereum. Uh, how do you, yeah, just give us your perspective on Avalanche vis-a-vis -vis Ethereum and the other so-called Ethereum killers. Sure. So uh, the t I hate that term. I hate it with a passion. I see myself as somebody who emerged out of the Ethereum community. I love Ethereum to bits. I hold a heck of a lot of Ethereum. And um, so uh, it's, it's something that, you know, I take kind of personally when people throw it at us. Our goal is not to kill anybody else. These chains are actually so resilient, no one's killing anybody. We've seen dead chains, broken chains, not die, right? Like they're technically not gonna go anywhere. There's something fundamentally broken and yet they're still traded and they're around. So no one's killing anyone. That's the, big, that's the beginning point. No one intends to kill anyone, at least not, not an avalanche. Uh, we have a different mission and I keep saying our mission is different. Our architecture is different. Our technical approach is different. The, the biggest Ethereum killer out there is Ethereum itself. Ethereum 2 is supposed to kill Ethereum 1. And also the Ethereum community, especially the Maxis, are going to be the death of Ethereum, if you ask me. The ones who throw this term around are really the worst, worst uh, aspects of the Ethereum community. So um, no, we're not an Ethereum killer. It's going to be around. It's doing just fine at what it does, um, which is chug along with proof of work. I'm not sure if Ethereum 2 is going to be here. I have a bunch of technical um, issues to raise about Ethereum 2. I've always had them. And I've always been vocal about them. And, uh, and it has a development process that I don't particularly like. So they committed too early to, to a solution, and, uh, which is Ethereum 2 for scaling. And that might not, I mean, they keep changing. And now, you know, there's talk about layer twos and so forth, which I think is a capitulation and then a, a mission that maybe that won't work. But in any case, you know, Ethereum should succeed. Our goal is not inwards oriented. This space is going to grow so much. There's only about $1 trillion in blockchain. There's $700 trillion of assets out there. The majority of which can be traded on a blockchain. So this space is going to grow. And that value is going to flow to chains that can absorb it. And we built exactly the right architecture for doing so. So I don't have to compete with or kill anybody else to succeed. My chain just has to, has to be, and it has to, to have the right sort of outreach to get people on board, and it has to have the right technological foundation to absorb the growth, which it does. So that's how I stand on this. And so when the term is thrown at me, I just kind of you know, raise my eyebrows. Um, we did talk to some, ma some uh, marketing people from Consensus. Uh, the company. And they said that that's a term they invented because it's a term that's supremely flattering to Ethereum, right? It elevates Ethereum. But we don't have to kill anybody. Ethereum is going to be just fine. We're going to do our own thing. We have been. We invent new asset types in Avalanche. You know, these layer twos are parasitic, but layer ones, especially, you know, run by creative people, we're doing new things. We're bringing new technology into the space. We're building new kinds of tools, and we're also built, bringing in new kinds of people and new kinds of assets on top of us. So that's what's really going to get us out of the morass we're in by growing the space. I always love the making a bigger tent because I believe very deeply in that as well. I want to talk a little bit about um, new assets, but also maybe new businesses and new business models. Um, one of the most interesting things I read about last year were uh, the emergence of these uh, initial litigation offerings. Um, can you talk about that? How and like, and maybe even hypothesize a little bit about what you could see emerging as a as a new way for people um, to coordinate capital and find in it 
innovative ways of basically dematerializing services. Let's talk about that. Let's do. That's such a fascinating topic. So um, about a year and a half ago, uh, a couple of us uh, from Ava Labs were sitting around with, uh, with a couple of friends and uh, the, the discussion revolved around the legal system, especially in the US and how those people who tend to win tend to be the people with very deep pockets. You and I might have some kind of a, a grievance, uh, even if we were to take it to court, there is no guarantee we'll win. There is a danger that we might have to even be out even more money. And often we will settle for far less than what is, what is rightfully ours. And the way to fix this is to find ways of channeling money to people who have a rightful grievance. And uh, what an initial litigation offering is, what an ILO is, is essentially a way to tokenize the outcome of a lawsuit. So essentially it's a way to raise money for, for the legal defense uh, or the legal legal uh, strategy of, of a litigant. And, uh, and then if that party wins, then the, the winnings are distributed to the people who funded the effort. So think of it as a Kickstarter for lawsuits. And um, when might this be a good idea? Well, it's especially a good idea when there is some litigation going on uh, of global reach, global importance, and a passionate community around it. So, uh, so when now those uh, things are met, blockchains are a fantastic way to rally support for your cause. And uh, the very first ILO happened in November. It was a success. It ended up raising all of the money it wanted to raise. Um, I should also mention the money goes to the legal team, so there is no risk of an exit scam. And this entire process is very well structured. So the payout, you know the payout is going to come to you. Um, and in the US, there's a, a predictable payout path as well. So it's going to take two and a half years for, you know, or two years to three years for, uh, for a complicated case, but probably not much longer than that. So, uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a thrilling environment. Uh, we ended up doing the very first ILO. It happened on Avalanche. Uh, we, I wasn't involved in it, but it was a separate company that ended up uh, tokenizing this case. The case was also fascinating, Nick. It was a, um, a, uh, someone in, uh, it, was a, it was actually a retired uh, math teacher from Michigan, uh, moved, to, uh, moved to just outside of LA. Uh, well, actually he first moved to the Mojave Desert and he grew these like ginormous uh, hemp plants. And uh, then he moved outside of LA. He had, uh, I forgot how many acres, I think he had 500 acres of, um, of hemp. And the local sheriff did not like the hemp. And he thought it wasn't hemp, it was, it was, uh, it was marijuana is, is what he decided. And he, one, one Friday, he gave some papers to the, the, the person in charge, you know, the fellow, the litigant. And then by Sunday, he had destroyed all 500 acres. The net worth of the product being destroyed is about $1 billion. It is the largest crop destruction in the United States. And it touches upon every, every hot button issue, right? Legalization. It's uh, you know, pains of legalization, old school sheriff meeting the new world and not liking it and due process, et cetera. This is all entangled in there. Fascinating case. And, uh, and so, uh, so he raised $250,000 for his, um, for his uh, case. He's seeking $1 billion in damages from the state of California. And uh, it's going to be wonderful to watch what happens. And I'm really proud that I'm one of the people who participated. I want to put my money um, in support of causes I care about. And I do believe very strongly in due process. And I believe in you know, giving, giving the small people the chance to fight the, the state uh, whenever possible and whenever they need to. So this is going to revolutionize, I think, the entire face of litigation in the United States. It's going to be fascinating. That is a very cool story. We'll be watching that one uh, with bated breath. Um, okay, awesome, Gary. I'll hand yeah. the next one to you. Yeah, yeah, we're we're starting to get close to the end of the time, and I want to, you know, as as someone who's deep in the weeds on security issues, um, you know, turn to the topic of of you know security. You know, a huge amount of um, you know exploits last year, hundreds of millions. We saw another massive uh, exploit just yesterday with this wormhole uh, exploit, uh, one of the biggest exploits. I think three hundred million, roughly. Uh, it's estimated of ETH that's been stolen. Um, you know, some people have strong views about, you know, the future of cross-chain, you know, assets moving back and forth in essence, um, you know, and, and a lot of people are very bullish. And, and this is where, you know, we can bring Bitcoin back into the conversation on something like Bitcoin is kind of a cross-chain collateral. Um, but what, what does yesterday's exploit 
say about the future of cross-chain compatibility, that type of flow between chains? Um, and, and are you uh, pretty bearish on, on that kind of technology? Yeah, let me say a few words. So first of all, my view of the world is not layer one versus layer two. All of these things are chains. Layer twos are chains. They are coupled to an underlying layer one using a fancier bridge perhaps, but they're all, they're all bridged chains. And um, none of the layer, layer twos are in any way more secure than any of these layer ones. In fact, most of the layer twos are centralized. They're, they depend on centralized components. Um, so there is a debate to be had about scaling via layer twos versus layer ones. And um, I'm happy to expand on it if necessary, but there's no need at the moment. Let's go into the wormhole discussion. The wormhole hack that happened yesterday is massive, um, but it stemmed from a smart contract bug. And so it has nothing whatsoever to do with layer one compatibility. It has nothing whatsoever to do with bridging. So it could have happened to anybody. It could have happened to any of the DeFi platforms. It could, you know, similar bug in Aave would cause even more money to be lost. And it could just, just happen, right? These bugs do happen with some frequency. Now, what is then the true root cause? So of the obvious root cause is a library routine in uh, Solana. So it was buggy and uh, the bridge was using it and the bridge was exploited. It just happened to be the bridge that was exploited, but that, that's about it. There's no, nothing, it says nothing about bridges in general. The, um, so then the, the second question is why was the bug there? Well, the bug is there because that code and that entire code structure code base has been not tested well enough. Um, the Solana folks are using a brand new um, code base. They're using Rust uh, and they're building their own infrastructure. So this is, a, this is an honorable goal, but it's a risky thing to do. And um, I know for, for a fact that many projects that are building on Solana are having difficulty getting their code audited. Not enough people know how to, how to audit this code for the blockchain environment. So Rust is a wonderful language, but you know, it, the ecosystem is not developed well enough that you can get your code audited. So it turns out, you know, bugs like this can happen. They did happen to Ethereum in its early days as well. And uh, when they do happen, uh, it's a learning opportunity. I think Solana is going to have many more of these. Those libraries probably have other bugs as well. So um, I think we should just brace for them. Uh, this is it's just it's just a fact of life that if you invent a new runtime, etc. Um, you're going to have to go through this growing, growing uh, pain uh, phase. So this is one of the reasons why at Avalanche, we did not invent a new language and a new runtime. We use the Ethereum virtual machine. It's time tested, it's well understood, it's quirky as heck, but its quirks are well understood, right? The DAO, the DAO issue a couple of years back, six years back, where I was also involved, um, taught us some of the quirks of that EVM. So I think uh, we're, I am super, I'm the opposite of bearish. I'm very bullish when it comes to the general space. Within the space, we're going to see that people who take, you know, essentially, uh, uh, you know, an approach like Solana did, where they invent a whole lot of new code, are going to be facing these kinds of problems. Uh, we're going to find that people whose approach to coding is performance first, then security next, are going to be facing a world of hurt. And um, that's just kind of inevitable. Um, parallel to this, there's going to be a war of bridges. The bridges are here to stay. We'll, we have been seeing a lot of bridging going on. Um, assets will go to chains that know how to use them best. So Avalanche has benefited immensely from this. We have a lot of TVL, uh, quite a lot of TVL actually, given where our market cap is. So a lot of assets have come to Avalanche and people come to Avalanche from Ethereum to perform their transactions and go back to Ethereum because it's cheaper to do that round trip than to, to, to do it on Ethereum. And, uh, and then final word on this, the, um, the Avalanche bridge uses fundamentally different technology. It uses Intel's SGX. It's, um, it's very, very constructed very differently. Doesn't use a smart contract on the Ethereum side. Doesn't use a smart contract on the Avalanche side. It's not smart contract based. So um, that puts us in a different category and reduces our attack, attack surface. So I am not the least bit worried about its implications for Avalanche. I don't believe it has any implications in general about how people should structure this. It does mean that, that uh, we need to pay much more attention to these new emerging uh, bridges because they will be with us forever. This is gonna be a bridged world. It's gonna be a multi-chain world. Awesome. Thanks for uh, weighing in on that topic. Um, 
I want to ask you about uh, things that keep you up at night that that <laughs> besides besides new programming languages being used for smart contracts and and uh, you know uh, not having gone through sufficient auditing, what are the things you worry about? Uh, I think you mentioned you're, you're a little worried about things getting centralized. You know, you talk about proof of stake and how uh, a relatively small uh, sample are actually voting. Uh, talk to me about yeah that decentralization versus centralization kind of battle and and other things that I might cause you to lose sleep. <laughs> okay, things that cause me to lose sleep. I, this is a kind of a funny joke. I, I actually have, but I don't sleep all that well for for my whole life. <laughs> so, so many things that cause me to lose sleep. But uh, I'll name a few. Um, one of the most important things is really this decentralization trade off. So especially in a bull market everything trades right everything everything gets attention everything looks great because after all like you know everybody's happy and there's more and more excitement and there's more funds coming into the space so then suddenly what you can have is you can have systems with a very weak foundation get elevated and when they inevitably collapse then it's a big blight on the space you know you got the mount gox situation where obviously a crappy exchange got really big and when it collapsed, it, it spelled a bear market for us for two years. And that's the kind of thing that really worries me. So um, I would really not like to see anything like the wormhole thing. It's a terrible thing to see. It's bad for all of us because it turns people away from the space. It makes them worry. And um, so, uh, so that's, that's something that really, uh, really concerns me. Uh, another thing that concerns me is chains that are deeply centralized, doing OK in good times that have not been tested yet in bad times. So there's a lot of chains out there. They promise cheap transactions. And you, you, so you figure out, so how do you get this cheap transaction? Oh, you know, we fix, we fix the transaction cost to something tiny. Okay, well then you don't have fee dynamics. When there is like actual use on your chain, fees have to spike. And if you don't have that dynamic, yeah, sure. You can have super artificially depressed um, prices for your transaction. But when there is load, then your, your users won't be able to interact with your chain. And, uh, and suddenly you're going to have, again, a, a, a user hurting catastrophe on your hands. We had one of these just maybe two weeks ago. Uh, and a lot of people got liquidated because they couldn't really top up their, uh, their lending platform collateral. So um, this is also bad for the space. Like those people now are going to leave. They're not going to come back. They've lost their faith in the, in the technology. So these are not good things. And, uh, you know, user education plays a key role here and um, getting the word out that, hey, you know, what you see on a good day is not indicative of what might happen on a bad day. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and we should adopt uniform, uniform ways of measuring and, and evaluating these platforms. These are hard messages to get across, uh, but they're essential. So I'm really worried about these. Um, and of course, the third thing that really worries me is regulation and its uncertain state. So any regulation, any kind of clarity is probably better than uncertainty and, uh, and this like gray zone that everybody operates in. So, um, so I worry a little bit about, especially new regulation that might clamp down on the space. I worry about what might happen in uh, developing countries as uh, they freak out and, uh, and they, if, especially if they have regressive regimes in place who are not tech savvy, they might decide, oh, this crypto thing is a, is a way for us to lose control of, of, of finance. They might clamp down on it. I worry about that quite a bit as well. And we actually do spend a lot of energy trying to educate uh, people and politicians across the world. Yeah, well, go ahead. I was gonna say that, uh, I mean, what this is a way to, I think, bring the architecture of Avalanche back into the conversation though too, because this topic of regulation uh, is getting a lot of attention and it's a lot of like, say, traditional block, you know, gaming companies think about NFTs and entering the blockchain gaming space, getting a lot of questions about play to earn, um, but concerns also about, well, do I need to start running KYC and anti-money laundering and, and uh, you know, how do I even do that and who's doing that in this space and, and, and uh, the flexibility I think you spoke to earlier. I can see being very attractive to a lot of um, established enterprises. Or, or in jurisdictions where there's a, a you know a cop on the beat who uh, is 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 being maybe a bit more aggressive, um, and uh, yeah, I'd be curious to hear, um, you know, uh, are you seeing examples of how that's being used already in terms of regulatory compliance and and what that looks like uh, on Avalanche? 
Absolutely. So uh, we are working with, uh, we're, we're in talks with a bunch of firms with um, uh, the aim of building what we call a walled garden for Wall Street. So uh, uh, for better or worse, there are lots and lots of really big financial institutions that have uh, the obligation to know the counterparty to every trade they facilitate. So if you're doing something, you need to know who's on the other side. Why? Because by law, you don't want to be interacting with, let's say, a terrorist, with like North Koreans, with Iranians, because there's a sanction, et cetera. So they need a solution and they cannot use DeFi as it is because DeFi as it is, it's uh, you know, on these monolithic chains, it's open to everybody. So uh, Avalanche with its subnet structure can handle exactly this case. We can create a subnet that is US centric where the rules for that subnet are different and special compared to the default C chain on Avalanche. So um, that's a very exciting area that I'm really, really thrilled to explore. Uh, there's a lot of uh, institutional money that would like to use blockchains, but cannot because they cannot get this, uh, get through this compliance barrier. So um, that's, that's one of the very exciting areas. In general, of course, my own personal hope is that the regulators will stop using the financial system to achieve enforcement goals. If you're going to do enforcement, you should go to enforcement. And uh, you know, imagine, imagine forcing these rules down all the way to, you know, to grocers, right? You go to your corner grocery store and uh, before he sells you a packet of gum, he says, are you a North Korean? You know, it's a crazy, crazy question to ask. But a similar thing is happening. So as blockchains replace the financial infrastructure, as we allow tiny, small projects to conduct business at global scale, then suddenly there's this gray zone. Are they obliged or should they be treated the same way we treat JP Morgan Chase? Or should they be treated more like the grocery store? It's really just, you know, five young, young fellows who, you know, wrote some code and put it on a blockchain. And suddenly, do you want to put on their shoulders the obligation to make sure that, you know, this, that doesn't happen? I and mean, it suddenly becomes a huge barrier to entry for, uh, for new projects. And it's a huge barrier to, to uh, growing this space and, and to, uh, to growing this technology. So I'm hoping that the regulators will see the light, that there's so much more value to be created here as opposed to uh, what they could regulate away by mistake. So, uh, so I'm hoping that they will see the light and there's a new report that's going to come out of the White House. And I'm hoping that they will make the right decisions and, and allow the space to flourish and technology to develop. I think we're, uh, we're all on the same page with that as we watch the internet get bigger and uh, the economy of the internet continue to add millions and hundreds of millions of new users to it over the coming decade. It's, uh, it's more users, it's more use cases, it's more business models, and new ideas, and a wide open pasture for entrepreneurs. So um, I think uh, in short here, we'll wrap up quickly, but um, I'm very grateful for all of your thoughts today. It's pretty obvious that the global capital markets are, are simultaneously being dematerialized, but also providing all of this fertile pasture for incredible new ideas to flourish. And uh, really interesting to hear all the things that you and the team at Apple Labs are working on and uh, the great success of uh, the Avalanche protocol. So for those that want to learn a little bit more, um, Emin, where should you send them? If they wanna hear and follow you and find out what's going on with Avalanche and keep track of all the updates coming up for 2022, um, where should people go learn? Um, one of the easiest places to remember is avox.network. That's a good starting point. And uh, from there, you could go to the ecosystem.avox.network and look at you know, the, couple, the first five things you might want to do on Avalanche. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I'm Elite Haxor, E-L-3-3-T-H-4-X-O-R. And um, uh, otherwise, just Google for Avalanche uh, blockchain and you will get a whole bunch of links to get started with. All right. Thank you very much and to everyone that tuned in. Uh, we're really grateful to have your time and attention for uh, this month's uh, market outlook and overview with our special guest. If you missed anything, uh, don't worry or fret. It'll be available on all your favorite channels. You'll also be able to subscribe um, to this podcast and all your favorite venues for 